welcome to What Clinicians Want to Know, the Current and Future Role of EZH1-2 Inhibitors in the Care of Patients with Lymphoma. This is medical oncologist Dr. Neil Love. For this program, I met with Dr. Jill Saul from the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York to provide an overview of his vision of the pathobiology of follicular lymphoma. So follicular lymphoma is quite of a fascinating disease, probably at the origin of the disease, although it's still debated, is the 1418 translocation that brings the BCL2 gene in the vicinity of the immunoglobulin gene, activating the expression of BCL2, which prevents the cells from dying. And after that, the cells, the current concept is that these cells continue to circulate in the body, continue to circulate in lymph nodes, receive additional signals, and undergo other mutations. But what we have to understand is that these cells uh, behave like normal B cells during many, many years before being completely malignant. So among the different mutations that they acquire, a mutation in what is called the epigenetic machinery, which is basically what control at a supramolecular level what regions of DNA are accessible for transcription. So what was identified in the vast majority, more than 90% of patients with follicular lymphoma, there are one or several, and more often several, mutations in many epigenetic modifiers, then, you know, the conformation of chromatin is organized for different expression of genes and the cell fate of these B cells. One of these genes that is mutated is called EZH2, which is part of a bigger complex, larger complex, PSC2. And what has been shown by many experiments in the uh, lab of Dr. Uh, Harry Melnick is that this EZH2 within this PRC2 complex really regulates the trafficking of B cells within the germinal center. And it regulates by modifying the methylation of uh, 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 one histone and the level of methylation of this histone. And basically, depending on the level of methylation of this histone, the cells can traffic, come into the germinal center, divide, and exit. So this is true for normal B cells. This is also true for abnormal B cells, such as the precursor of follicular lymphoma. What happens and what was shown is that this gene is mutated in about 20 to 25% of follicular lymphoma, and this mutation increases the methylation of this histone uh, 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 um, uh, gene. And basically, it locks the... B cells within the germinal center when they can further proliferate and survive and potentially accumulate other mutation. However, this biology of EZH2 is not only important in follicular lymphoma with this mutation, but in all follicular lymphoma because this is really a key gene in the regulation of B cell differentiation and trafficking with the germinal center. Because of that, it was logical to develop drugs that will target this enzyme. So, you know, sometimes I wonder if I'm the last one to understand some bi biologic things, but let me ask you a really basic question. When you talk about epigenetic mutations, how does that differ than the kind of mutations we hear about in lung cancer? You know, EGFR, RET, I know it seems kind of a simple question, but sort of inside the cell, what's the difference? Well, I think that the mutation can, you know, the mutations are mutated genes. The question is, what is the function of this gene? So if we talk about the receptors, such as EGFR, uh, I mean, there is then signalization through the receptors that makes the cell proliferate. If we talk about mutation in BCL2, the cell will survive. If we take about other kind of mutations, regulating different complex. Here, probably in epigenetic, it's a little bit another level of understanding because the epigenetic is already the control of the expression of genes. So it's a little bit more complex to elucidate what the function of these genes. They usually don't interact alone. They interact with multimolecular complex 
in regulating gene expression. But at the same time, I will say that most of epigenetic mutation, which are occurring in many other cancers, are really regulating the uh, origin, the fate of the cancer cells. So let's talk a little bit about current management of follicular lymphoma, and then we can drill down a little bit more in terms of EZH2. And, you know, in preparation uh, for working with you, we actually did a survey of 50 general medical oncologists in community-based practice. These are the same docs who are taking care of bladder cancer, CLL, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. And uh, in addition, well, I'm going to show you some of the data uh, from the survey, but we also asked them for questions and cases to run by you. And I just picked out one of the cases because the next question I have for you is maybe to talk a little bit more about the biology in terms of this case that I wanted to tell you about in terms of the natural history of the disease, because it kind of, it does seem you know, somewhat unique or certainly different, almost reminds me a little bit of breast cancer in a way. But anyhow, this uh, the case that was sent in, in is a 87-year-old woman who actually did have a history of breast cancer. And she actually got treated for five years with uh, endocrine therapy and then was diagnosed with follicular lymphoma. The first time was 20 years ago and got mm -hmm. treated with rituximab alone. And then the second time was 15 years ago, got rituximab again, and then last year got BR, then uh, progressed, and now the doc is trying to decide tazimetastat, mosinituzumab, EBCO he brings up. Uh, the patient's EZH2 wild type. So the first question before we kind of get into you know decision making here is, any explanation for this history where you go back 20 years, the patient stays in remission, then all of a sudden the disease accelerates? Is that related to the microenvironment? Again, it kind of reminds me of breast cancer. It's like all of a sudden, 10 years later, it blows up. Any thoughts? Yeah, I think we really learned that follicular lymphoma is a disease where the malignant cells, um, when we identify it, when the disease developed, is coming from a very early precursor malignant cell that probably survived for many, many years in the body and survived without necessarily proliferating, surviving, trafficking within lymph nodes. As I explained with the 1418 translocation, the overexpression of BCL2 that making trafficking. And from time to time, from this clonal precursor cells, what we call CPC, there are subclones that emerge that have accumulated other mutations. And it's also a disease where we do know that these malignant B cells are under the control within the lymph node or the bone marrow of T cells. And we do know that this T cell can control the disease for years and years. And when we give rituximab to this patient, you know, we destroy part of these cells, we destroy part of the tumor cell, probably not uh, this clonal precursor cell, not the cancer stem cell, but we destroy the growth of these emergencies. So I think it's an equilibrium between the immune system and the cancer cells that can stay quiet for years, can emerge, can be treated with immune-based therapies such as rituximab and probably no other agents that we'll discuss. And unfortunately, from time to time, there is a reemergence of clones that are probably have acquired all the mutations, develop more quickly, and probably need a more aggressive treatment, such as the one this patient received, which is bendamustine rituximab, or can be other things. So let's talk about the current clinical approach uh, to follicular lymphoma. First, in terms of first line therapy, this lady, as you hear, uh, actually was treated with rituximab alone. Uh, can you talk about how you think through first-line therapy in an elderly patient like this? Hey, well, this lady, I guess, was actually 67 when she first got diagnosed, so she really wasn't that old. Uh, but how you, you know, take age, performance status, and the disease status and decide what you're going to do first-line? Yeah, this is usually easy. I mean, patients, I tend to categorize them in three groups. The first one are patients with localized disease stage one or, or regroup stage two, where radiation therapy is useful and still be on the table to be discussed. Then we tend to 
classify patients according to the GELF criteria, which represent an assemble of things, the size of the tumor, B symptoms, biological symptoms, any compression. If the patient don't have GELF criteria, we do know that this patient have a very good outcome. They can be eventually observed, which is a usually recommendation in most academic centers, but some patients are not comfortable with that and will prefer to be treated. And in this case, I will say that rituximab single agent is a treatment of choice. Then they have the patient in which the tumor have a certain bulk, uh, symptoms, biological things, where usually the standard of care have been immunochemotherapy. In the old days, rituximab CVP. We didn't feel that CHOP is uh, recommended for the majority of these patients, and now mostly rituximab and bendamustine. Obviously, there is a gray zone, and the gray zone could be patients that do not meet GELF criteria but want to be treated early or meet GELF criteria but we prefer to use rituximab single agent. And, you know, this is a discussion between the patients, the oncologist, um, the life expectancy and things like that. I, I will say in a practice seeing a lot of follicular lymphoma every week, I have the, all these kind of patients and discussing and individualizing treatment for each of these patients is very important. What about the role of obinutuzumab? So, obinutuzumab has been shown when combined with chemotherapy, either bendamustine or CHOP or CVP, to increase the response rate slightly and to prolong the progression-free survival. When the drug was developed, it was used at different doses than rituximab. The first cycle introduced three doses of obinutuzumab instead of one uh, with rituximab. And there were more side effects, including probably more infections in patients and more hematologic toxicity. For this reason, I think that many clinicians have stepped back to rituximab instead of using obinutuzumab. Some still use obinutuzumab when they want to treat patients a little bit more aggressively, younger patients that may benefit for a longer treatment-free interval. Or when you use, want to use CVP instead of bendamustine for different reasons, some people tend to step back from bendamustine regarding the T-cell depletion during COVID and things like that. Obinutuzumab CVP is better than rituximab CVP. And while there will be a little bit more side effect at the beginning, it's not a major hurdle. So I think the majority of people use rituximab, but obinutuzumab can be helpful in some circumstances. You know, I just had kind of a flashback to, I think it was called the STILL trial that was a BR versus RCHOP. And I remember interviewing Dr. Rommel at that time. It was kind of like people couldn't believe that BR was better than RCHOP. Any explanation for why, you know, many years later? Well, I think um, what, what is very clear, I will say, is that bendamustine rituximab is better tolerated than RCHOP. That's for sure because... You have less cytopenia, there is no hair loss, there is no cardiac toxicity. And because of that, and because of the risk of histologic transformation of follicular lymphoma in the future, which then patient will need to have antracycline, we prefer to defer the use of antracycline. Whether it's really, you know, the two trials, whether it's a steel trial, whether it's the uh, 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 German trial, uh, uh, really show marked superiority remains a little bit debatable, I will say. And, you know, I will say some time to time, I do see patients with a large bulk, with high LDH. I'm a little bit concerned there could be an occult transformation, and I prefer to use CHOP for this patient. There were different inclusion criteria in the STEEL trial, even in the BRIGHT trial that was performed here in North America that compared bendamustine rituximab versus either CHOP rituximab or RCVP. Um, you know, CHOP and CVP were combined together in the comparison. Yes, bendamustine was shown to be better, but there is no doubt that bendamustine is better than CVP. And again, there have been debated questions regarding this trial. Because it's better tolerated, bendamustine with Bismad has become, you know, 80% of the chemotherapy delivered. But I think there are some patients in which other options might be considered. So let's talk a little bit about EZH2 mutations. And also, as we go through this, I'm going to tell you some of the questions that oncologists had about that. this. And of course, one of the key things here is the type of assay to do. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, how the assay is done and in what situations, in follicular lymphoma, uh, 
uh, you uh, do the assay? Well, the question of detection mutation in follicular lymphoma is uh, obviously a question that is not necessarily routine practice at this time, because except this drug, tazemetostat, there is no targeted therapy for any mutation, despite the fact that there are many mutation present. So I think there are two uh, scenarios. The one is when we have access to a panel of sequencing, um, you know, foundation medicine or other kind of panels that will investigate several genes. And what is interesting is they will usually pick up EZH2 and there are mutations of EZH2 that are canonical in one region, but there are also a few others that probably have the same functions. So they will detect all these mutations. Then there is an FDA approved test, uh, uh, which really detect only the canonical mutation. And that can be ordered only if you want to know whether is it H2 mutated or not, because you want to prescribe this drug or not. With this canonical test, we may miss a few mutations that still uh, are present. So I think it depends where you are, what kind of access uh, uh, your patients have, what insurance will be covering. Um, you can do that because you systematically assess your patient. We do know that patient with ZH2 mutation had initially a little more favorable prognosis than the other ones with immunochemotherapy at least. Uh, but if you want to use it at the time of relapse, you can order the simple test just detecting this mutation. So a couple of questions from the oncologists in the survey. One, is there any point of retesting a patient who initially gets uh, is tested and found to be wild type? A second question from a bunch of oncologists was any potential role of liquid biopsy? So regarding the retesting, I think um, EZH2 is here usually at the beginning of the disease when the disease uh, arrives. Um, you know, we do know that there is a lot of heterogeneity in follicular lymphoma and clonal heterogeneity develop years after years. So I will say if your patient was diagnosed 10 years ago and sequenced, received two or three lines of treatment, maybe you can reinvestigate that. But I will say in the majority of the cases, it's stable because it's one of the founder mutation. So I will usually not retest the patient if the patient was found to be negative. Uh, regarding liquid biopsy, we do know that uh, liquid biopsy can detect this mutation. And actually in this trial, initially, some liquid biopsy was performed to detect this LH2 mutation. We reported the result where, where, where published in at ASH many, many years ago. So I think if you have a good liquid biopsy test, you can probably detect the ZH2 mutation in the circulating tumor DNA. So circulating tumor DNA, as we know, is going to be one of the forefront way to uh, uh, basically identify mutation in uh, cancer and lymphoma. And yes, ZH2 is easily detectable if you have this assay. So are there commercially available liquid biopsies that a general medical oncologist can order right now? Uh, I'm not aware of those, or is it H2 particularly? Right. So we're seeing more and more of that in uh, solid tumors. So let's talk a little bit about uh, EZH2 inhibition, um, starting with tazemetostat. What's your vision about the mechanism of action? Well, tazemetostat is blocking the enzyme, and it's basically blocking the, uh, uh, I, I mentioned that this enzyme methylate DNA, so it reverts this hypermethylation in DNA, and what has been quite interesting when the phase one of this enzyme was, uh, 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 or this inhibitor was done, it was done first of all in B-cell lymphoma, also there is a rare tumor in uh, pediatrics and some sarcoma, which has mutations that also involves this PRC2 complex and may be sensitive to this drug, is that this drug is well tolerated. And I think that was an important message for an oral therapy, and it was found to be active in some B-cell malignancies. So blocking this enzyme was able to basically revert the uh, uh, hypermethylation of the uh, uh, histone H3 in the lysine 27, and this was assessed uh, pharmacologically on skin biopsy in patients during this phase one trial. So really, the drugs hit the target. And I know there are other EZH2 inhibitors in development. You mentioned or talked about one in your talk, valimetastat. 
What's the difference uh, in mechanism with these other EZH2 inhibitors compared to tazimetastat? Yeah, there have been many drugs uh, uh, attempted to develop this pathway because, again, we do know follicular lymphoma is important, but the EZH2 is probably regulating all the uh, uh, fate of all the tumors in, in the body. Um, tazimetastat is a specific inhibitor of EZH2, while there are all the other enzyme, which is EZH1, and valimetostat inhibits both EZH1 and EZH2. Um, I will say, at, up to my knowledge, it's probably one of the only ones that is inhibited both. Uh, other inhibitors have been developed, mostly EZH2 specific. Whether there is a real benefit when we come to follicular lymphoma, I don't think we have shown that, but probably EZH1 is important in the biology of T-cell lymphoma, or inhibiting both may be more important in T-cell lymphoma. Can you kind of summarize what we know about monotherapy efficacy with tazimetostat? Yes. Um, the uh, monotherapy with tazimetostat has been uh, assessed in a phase two study that led to the drug approval. There were basically two cohorts each of one a little bit more than 50 patients. So if we look at the cohort of patients with a mutation of EZH2, um, there were about two-thirds of the patients that had a response, and one-third had that a complete response. If we look at the population of patients without the mutation of EZH2, there were about one-third of the patients that had an overall response, but the CR rate was very low, about 4%. What was, however, very amazing in these two cohorts is that the duration of response, which was about one year, was roughly identical in both cohorts. And this was the same for the progression-free survival, which was also about one year. It should be noted that probably the wild type cohort had a little bit more severe patients, patients with more advanced disease, with more lines of therapy, and you cannot really compare head-to-head -head these two cohorts. This was not a randomization between these cohorts. But it's probably that, you know, despite the lower response rate, the lower CR rate, there was uh, uh, still in the non-mutated cohort the same clinical benefit about one year. Despite the fact that all patients had some adverse event, and this was relapsed patient, in fact, only 10% of the patient has a dose reduction, one quarter has a dose interruption, and less than 10% discontinue for toxicity. These toxicities were mostly grade 1, 2, fatigue, some GI effect, infections, things like that. And the grade 3, 4 events, which were present in less than 5% of the patient, are essentially hematologic with anemia, thrombocytopenia, or neutropenia. They are reversible. You can decrease the dose. The usual dose is 800 milligrams twice a day. You can go back to 400 twice a day, and usually patients recover quickly from the heme toxicity. Just kind of curious, I don't know that there have been any double-blind randomized studies uh, of tazimetostat monotherapy, but if there were placebo control, do you think you could tell the difference clinically? I'm not saying whether you could, you know, in the trial with the data, but clinically, if you were do, had a placebo control, do you think you could tell the difference? Well, there is one difference which is amazing uh, in terms of toxicity, which is uh, the fact that women treated with uh, a tazimetostat often has alopecia. There is a little bit of mucositis, a little bit of things like that. And obviously, the heme toxicity is particular when it occurs. But I will say the other side effects are, you know, kind of side effects you will encounter in uh, the field of oncology quite classically. I mean, if I compare to PI3 kinase inhibitor or to BDK inhibitors, I will say you don't have the spectrum of quite specific side effects like GI symptom, rashes, and things like that, or uh, bleeding uh, uh, that you increase, you have with these oral, oral drugs. Hey, I guess another thing would be again, if you could do a study comparing um, monotherapy to you know standard of care, um, whether you know you would see a difference in patient reported outcomes. Well, I think uh, we have to do it, and I don't know the result until the study ha ha has been done. But uh, my impression, I mean, having treated quite a handful of patients with this drug, is that overall some patients feel it's very well tolerated. Others, as I mentioned, have this, you know, side effect. Alopecia is one. 
and GI symptoms and moderate other symptoms is another one. So, you know, when I asked you about the side effects and you said there's one thing, I kind of knew that was what you're going to say because you brought that up in your talk, the alopecia in women. And I have to ask, like, what's the mechanism why you would see it in women and not in men? And I have to answer you is that, unfortunately, I don't know. Well, that's a good answer. I have answer. to answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I can answer again because I had a, a there was a beep at that time. But yeah, I don't I don't know the mechanism of alopecia with this drug that is sex specific. So I guess another issue is oncology. We're always combining things, and I'm curious if you could talk about some of the, the strategies combining tazimetastat that are being looked into, including in the first line. Yeah, I think, you know, when you have a drug that is well tolerated and you think you want to increase the response rate and uh, 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 increase the uh, efficacy of current drugs, you can think about combinations. In the first line, there was one study done in Europe combining rituximab shop with tazemetostat. I think the preliminary results were presented last year at ASH. I don't think they were, you know, leading us to change practice. Um, there are uh, other trials that are being done, tazemetostat with venetoclax, tazemetostat with uh, um, mosinetuzumab, the bispecific antibodies, or with rituximab. But there is one trial which is actually ongoing where patients with relapsed follicular lymphoma are receiving the R-square regimen, the combination of rituximab, linalidomide, plus tazemetostat. There was a leading phase of this trial where we treated about 40 and so patients just to assess the safety of uh, uh, this combination. And we have presented the result actually uh, uh, almost two years ago uh, during the ASH meeting, and they will be submitted for publication soon. The take-home message is the following. First of all, in terms of tolerability, when you add tazemetostat with uh, the R-square regimen, you encounter some side effects. Some of the side effects are the one you will find with R-square, you know, with lenalidomide, you have 15% of so of the patient having a rash. You have, again, some GI symptoms. You have a little bit of heme toxicity. I will say it's likely that the heme toxicity is increased by the combination of lenalidomide and tazemetostat and rituximab. And it's likely that there are maybe also some other minor side effects that are either increased in frequency or in severity. But overall, grade 3, 4 toxicity where... Uh, uh, acceptable rate. Um, in terms of response rate, what was interesting with this, uh, uh, you know, running phase from the trial is that more than 90% of the patient had a response and half of them, 50% of the patient had a complete response. And this was true in different categories of patient, whether this was patient with early relapse, the so-called POD24 or not, refractory to rituximab or not, but also whether this patient had a mutation of EZH2 or not. When they had the mutation of EZH2, the overall response rate was still 90%. The CR rate was a little bit higher in the 70s or so. Um, but, you know, again, most of the patient responded and the CR rate was still 50% in unmutated case. So based on these results, there is an ongoing phase three trial comparing R square alone versus R square plus metastat. And I think we are recruiting well in this trial, uh, but obviously it will uh, better assess the role of this drug in the management of follicular lymphoma in the future. Have you or would you use that triplet combination outside a trial setting if you could? I will say if I could use it, I will probably be tempted to use it because, you know, it's two overall drugs. We know very well lenalidomide. We know very well uh, uh, R-square. And I think tazemetostat, as I said, may complicate a little bit the management of patients. But you can easily modulate, you know, the dose of lenalidomide, eventually decrease from 20 milligram to 10 milligram. And I don't think it will impair the effect. And I think for patients that would like to achieve a more substantiated response, um, especially the unmutated case, this could be tempting. However, we don't have a longer follow-up regarding the duration of response, uh, potential long-term side effect. So I will be cautious to discuss the risk and benefit with the patient before using it off-label.
So uh, speaking of lenalidomide, what about the issue of second cancers, uh, both with tazimetastat and tazimetastat R squared? Yeah, I think this is still a, a question that is um, up in the air without a formal response. In the phase two study of single agent, there were a few uh, myeloid diseases that were diagnosed, very few, but there were not many patients either. So it's very difficult to understand whether this patient will have developed you know, MDS or leukemia because they had received several lines of chemotherapy. Some of them have received transplant before uh, 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 tazemetostat. So we don't know yet. Um, in the R square plus TAS, there was also one case of uh, uh, acute leukemia, and there have been one or two other cases maybe of heme toxicity. So I think there is maybe something to be uh, looked at. And with the development, further development of this drug and even of this family of drug, whether there are potential heme toxicity, uh, it's important. We do know that EZH2 is mutated in some myeloid leukemia, and these are different mutations. That is a loss of function. At the opposite of the mutation we have in follicular lymphoma, which are gain of function. So I will say, to me, the hypothesis that in some cases you may uh, impair hematopoietic stem cell is possible. And, you know, the caution is the duration, the dose, and all these factors, and we need to investigate that. Has a tazimetostat been looked at in T-cell lymphoma or diffuse large B-cell? So, in uh, patients with T-cell lymphoma, I don't think we have data or maybe a handful of patients. I think in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, there were a few patients in the early phase one. Um, I think there have been one or two responses I will say it's hard to, to say. EZH2 is mutated in some subset of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, the so-called GCB subtype. As you know, we are not able to categorize that in routine practice, but I will say maybe with liquid biopsy, with you know more available way to genotype patients with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, a category of this patient may respond. I had actually one patient that had a long-term response with this drug and DLBCL. I'm just kind of curious because you have such a huge practice, amazing number of patients that you see. Uh, looking at your own practice, but also looking at the data, can you talk a little bit about the cause of death in patients with follicular lymphoma? How many die of other causes? How many die from transformation? How many die from follicular lymphoma? Well, I think this is an interesting uh, uh, question that, yeah, when you are concentrating your effort in this disease, you ask yourself, and we look at that with uh, a colleague from Mayo Clinic and a colleague from France years ago, and we found that the leading cause of death remains lymphoma, but it's mostly transformed lymphoma. And when you look nowadays with all the tools we have, immunochemotherapy, rituximab, well, PI3 kinase are not here anymore, but we have tazemetostat, and now we have bispecific, we have CAR-T. I don't recall seeing a patient with without a history of transformed follicular lymphoma, dying from follicular lymphoma, unless I had suspected the transformation and proven it. And I think that's what we published some years ago, showing that the leading cause was really histologic transformation when lymphoma was a cause. Unfortunately, some patients, you know, have other cause of death, um, you know, another cancer, uh, intercurrent disease, infections, like all patients with hematologic malignancies, and obviously, we have to take care of this patient and be careful about that. And obviously, there are treatment-related deaths, probably in the time where we were more aggressive with this patient with allotransplant and so on. But still, you know, we do CAR-T, we do bispecifics, and there may be uh, risk associated with these drugs eventually. But I will say, I don't think I have seen a patient with follicular lymphoma without a history an actual transformation or suspicion of transformation dying from this disease in the last five years. So let's again talk about decision maybe. First, can you kind of go through the FDA indication? I think there are a lot of questions about the, what the FDA is saying about wild type. Well, the FDA look at the result and, you know, you have a much higher response rate, a higher CR rate, which I quoted of 30%. In fact, it's 15% CR rate. Uh, but two-thirds of the patient response, you have a duration of response of one year. So I will say it was a little bit logical to privilege this patient with the mutation. So 
the FDA have allowed the use of tazemetostat in patients with at least two lines of therapy. We do know we have many effective drugs in this setting and the mutation of EZH2 as a single agent. But they were also looking at the data regarding the duration of response, the PFS, the tolerability of the drug. And based upon that, they say, well, if a patient already treated doesn't have another satisfactory alternative option, we can use it independently of the mutation status. So, you know, when you come to older patients, patients with comorbidity, frailty, depending on their history, you may consider tazemetostat as a treatment option. Yeah, it's interesting that they put in there, you know, in terms of not having a good clinical alternative. To me, that means it's really the judgment of the clinician. They want to use it third line, EZH wild type, but seems like they can. Is that your take? Yeah, I take it like that. I mean, we, we do know, I mean, the, the field has changed also at that time, you know, the uh, uh, PI3 kinase were approved, they're not approved anymore. So, you know, there are different drugs that are here and there, but by specifics are available, but by specifics maybe um, there is a learning curve regarding the management in community practice, which I hope will pick up because these are very effective agents. So, you know, you have to discuss what you want to do with your patient, what's the goal of your patient, like always with follicular lymphoma patients. So, yeah, I mean, of course, the you know, bispecifics have been so exciting in general and including in follicular lymphoma. When you think about and I've been surprised when you talk to general, I mean, we do surveys all the time. It, I'm not sure how much has actually gotten out to the community at this point. We talk a lot about, you know, that. We talk about the patient starting in a tertiary center, going back to the community, but I'm not really sure exactly how much of that is really happening right now. What is your impression? Uh, my impression is that it's a slow start. It's a slow start because it's also heme malignancies, but we do see bispecific coming in solid tumors. And then, you know, our colleagues in the community will have to get used and equipped probably for this treatment. I will say... I treated many patients with follicular lymphoma with bispecifics, and in many of the patients, it's easy. Um, you know, one of the agents, um, despite being used intravenously at this time, mosinotuzumab, you can always predict a little bit, and if you get your patient well hydrated, you give steroids, you inform the patient, um, you know, if you have a nurse practitioner that can call the patient the next day and decide whether you give again steroids, I mean, most of the patient will stay ambulatory, and it's really exceptional that the patient has to be hospitalized for severe CRS. Obviously, it's a concern, and if you have, you know, uh, not access to a facility for that, I can imagine that colleagues are reluctant to start. But this drug is going to be given subcutaneously in the future. Epcoritamab can be given already subcutaneously. You can a little bit more predict the time where patient will have CRS. And, you know, it's much less frequent with follicular lymphoma than it is with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma with other drugs or obviously mantle cell lymphoma, which is not approved. So I will say I'm quite convinced that there will be a learning curve for follicular lymphoma patient. And grade one CRS is fever and you give a little bit of steroids and patient result. The number of patients that have really grade two, which need to be you know, in the clinic, at least for hydration and eventually oxygen for a couple of hours are rare, frankly speaking. So I'm curious what your thoughts are in terms of indirect comparison of efficacy of bispecifics, let's say mosinotuzumab uh, versus tazemetostat in a mutated patient. Well, I think, you know, it's always very careful to compare cross-trial comparison, but um, you know, one of the um, major finding with uh, 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 bispecific mosinotuzumab or epcoritamab or odronextamab not yet available is the high response rate. And, you know, you have 70 to 80 percent of response, even 80, 85 in some. And you have about, you know, 60 to 75 percent of the patients that reach a complete response. So in terms of achieving a complete response, it's clear that bispecific um, give a higher proportion of patients, even the mutated case, that will achieve a complete response. Regarding the duration of response, I mean, most patients will have a duration of response of bispecific of probably two, three years when they respond, and the median PFS will be in the range usually of 18 months to 36 months, depending on, on the molecules. And we don't have 
mature data for all of them, but I will say two, three years for most of them. So we don't have that with tamazimetostat. But what I see with tamazimetostat is that when you have a frail patient, an older patient, you want to avoid this side effect. Having a normal drug, patient doesn't have to come in clinics. It's light monitoring in terms of uh, labs. You know, the patient may experience stabilization of the disease. So if the patient doesn't have significant symptoms related where you want to have a rapid effect, doesn't want to come to your clinic, doesn't want to get injection frequently, less monitoring, I think it's an option. It's also an option that I see sometimes, you know, as a pose. Obviously, I'm involved in many clinical trials. I have many uh, proposals for patients which have constraints. Well, if you want to give tazemetostat to this patient, you can give them for a limited period of time. You do know, you know, you may not have many, many patients which will have a long-term benefit. But if you benefit six months, one year, 18 months, you know, you have a pose with a well-tolerated agent. What do we know about EZH2 inhibition and the immune response, including with tazemetostat? I don't think we have many data yet on that. And uh, I think, uh, um, well, if we were talking about immune response, B cell, response to vaccination, I don't think we have many data, but I suspect there is nothing. What is interesting is that EZH2 control functions in B cells and control functions in T cells. In B cells, EZH2 also control the expression of a couple of adhesion molecules, including CD58, for instance. So when we inhibit EZH2, we increase the expression of CD58. So we probably increase the uh, immunogenicity of the tumor. And in T cells, it control the cell fate of T cells and several active T cells. So there are a lot of in vitro experimental data really showing that EZH2 is able to reinforce immune effect of immune effector drug. And that's the rationale of this trial, combining EZH2 with mosinetuzumab. It's the rationale of the combination with R-square. There is a trial right now also going on with EZH2 in the context of CAR T cells. So it's possible that using these molecules with immune therapies will increase the efficacy of immune-based therapies. What do we know about uh, efficacy of tazemetostat after bispecifics, and for that matter, after CAR-T? Well, I don't think we know much more about that. I will say the fact that the patient had received already a bispecific or CAR-T will not prevent me from using tazemetostat. But again, you know, we, we don't have data. The development took uh, place before these drugs were approved. So we mentioned the fact that there are other uh, EZH, EZH uh, inhibitors, including velometostat. What do we know about velometostat? I guess one of the things that's interesting is it's being looked at or has been looked at with peripheral T-cell lymphoma and I think diffuse large B-cell. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so velometostat is really uh, the first EZH1 and EZH2 inhibitors that has been active in development. I think there is another one, but probably with less uh, available data. And what was interesting is that during the initial uh, uh, phase one study, there were responses in T cells, there was responses in B cells, including some DLBCL and follicular lymphoma. But because T cell lymphoma is such an unmet need, when you have a drug that works in T-cell lymphoma, it was obviously tempting uh, uh, to look further at the development of this drug in patients with T-cell lymphoma. And this was done in a, a, a phase two study, which was reported, and I heard soon to be published, where patients were receiving a, a, a valimetostat in relapse uh, a peripheral T-cell lymphoma. There is a category of patients that actually uh, was interesting for that, which is patient with something that is very rare here in the United States, which is HTLV1-associated T-cell lymphoma, where there have been a good response. In patients with peripheral T-cell lymphoma, about half of the patients have a response. There is 30 to 40 percent, if I recall, of complete response. There is some hematological toxicity, but the drug is active. And based upon these results, there are further development of these drugs, which are envisioned either to get an approval in this situation, which is a huge unmet need, or in combination with other drugs in the management of T-cell lymphoma. And I hope that this drug will continue to develop in this field.
I'm kind of curious. I know you have a huge practice with uh, follicular lymphoma. Like about how many patients a year have you, like say in the last year, did you send for CAR-T? Well, still not many. I will say less than five uh, per year. So a few, but not many compared to the practice. Any comments on uh, the efficacy, uh, both in your own uh, hands as well as the reported efficacy? Well, in my own hands, all my patients get a CR, so it's clearly <laughs> impressive. You get a complete response. Uh, but, you know, the, 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 the rate of complete response is, you know, 80, 90 persons. This is a very sensitive tumor to CAR T. Um, I have one patient that relapsed like two and a half, three years later, so I'm not sure it's curative. The other patients are maintaining CR. Um, from the published data, it's probably a longer duration of response than what you have with bispecifics. But, you know, again, these were not necessarily the same patients in trial. Um, it's, this is cross-trial comparison. And I can understand that the patient preferred to try bispecific before trying CAR-T, given the constraints with CAR-T. We are talking about second cancers, talking about T-cell. I spent a little time uh, with your colleague, Dr. Horowitz, as I've done many times over the years. And he had a pretty interesting thing to say that I had never heard before about, and I guess it's kind of a little bit off topic, but it was so interesting, I have to run it by you, about the observation of T-cell lymphoma in patient getting CAR-T. And I'm going to tell you what he, he says. He thinks that some of these people have underlying angioimmunoblastic T-cell lymphoma that wasn't appreciated. Any thought? I never heard that before. Any thoughts? And what are your thoughts about? I mean, I know it's a little off topic about why these T cell lymphomas no. have been showing up. I I, I think um, well, the, the, there is probably three phenomena that occur after CAR T. There is something which is very rare, uh, which is the integration of the virus, the integration of the car within um, the T cells, and this develops a T-cell lymphoma leukemia. This a case report has been published years ago by UPenn, and now we are hearing about a few other cases. Probably very rare. There is a second hypothesis, which is mentioned by Steve Horvitz, which I believe is true, is that there are patients that develop T-cell lymphoma, you know, while being treated with B-cell lymphoma. I have seen that. Maybe they have ATL, and maybe what emerged was a B cell component, but then the T cell component emerged. We know it's an ITL. Sometimes there is a B cell component. But you know, it's known that some patient actually with, um, treated with B cell lymphoma sometimes will develop T cell lymphoma years later, unrelated and not necessarily ITL. And what we have to be careful when we look at secondary lymphoma, T cell lymphoma in patient with, uh, treated with CAR T is that the immunologic pressure on CAR T uh, on the tumor is so high that sometimes we have undifferentiated tumors, tumors that probably emerge from the same clone but don't carry any more B cell antigen. And I know a few cases that have been reported as T cell lymphoma, uh, but in fact, there were, you know, de differentiation of the tumor clone. And this is something we know in follicular, for instance, you know, sometimes follicular give Hodgkin lymphoma, give histiocytic sarcoma. This is very rare that the differentiation of the tumors may exist and may happen after T-cell. So different phenomena, very rare things. We have seen some. What do we know about uh, tazimetastat uh, in patients with POD24? So I think the data are really scarce. You know, they come from the uh, original phase two studies. There were not that many patients. I think my impression from these data, which we presented, I think, two, three years ago, is that there have been some response, there have been some duration of response, but it's a little bit inferior to what you observe in all commas. So here's actually a case like that, a 65-year-old patient that we presented in this uh, survey or theoretical uh, scenario who gets BR but then relapses uh, five months later requiring treatment. And we asked these oncologists uh, how they think through therapy in that situation, EZH2 mutant or not. How do you think it through? And what do you think about these responses? It looks like even in spite of the fact they progress shortly after BR, if it's wild type, people are going with R squared. But if it's mutated, at least the oncologists say tazimetastat. What do you say? 
Well, I think there is a lot of discussion regarding POD24, and I'm one of the proponents saying, you know, if the patient is not transformed, this patient is not necessarily at high risk, but still, you know, this is a 65-year-old patient that failed a very good therapy, which is BR, and I will be really hesitant to give a therapy with, you know, 60% overall response rate, 10-15% of CR rate, while we have other available agent, R-square is one of the regimen. Um, yeah, I mean, mosinotuzumab is not uh, approved here than a butimnibobinotuzumab either. But, you know, I think these are probably more efficient in this setting. I mean, it's probably a little bit early to talk about CAR-T, but, you know, there have been recommendations made by some colleagues years ago saying that a patient that relapsed POD24 should be for considered for transplant. So I will say, to me, it's a little bit difficult to consider tazemetostat in this patient. We were talking before about EZH uh, inhibition in uh, T cell and diffuse large B cell. Do you think it's worthwhile uh, for oncologists in general practice to test these patients for EZH2 mutations when you really, I guess there's really nothing they can be able to do about it. Let's send them to a trial. Yeah, well, I think as we discuss with this 65 year old patient, um, if the patient has really other options and you want to achieve a sustained response, I mean, a high rate of response, sustained response, I think there are many other options. I will not necessarily consider, you know, I want to test because I want to use it or not. If the patient is frail, don't have options, or if the patient has already went to five, six lines of therapy and is a little bit fed up of things, I will say I don't care about the mutation status. Why, why don't you use TAS? TAS is approved. You don't have alternative options. So these older patients, which was one of the clinical case, have went to two, three other lines of therapy or even one or two lines of therapy, doesn't want something very with a lot of constraints. I... I think whether or not the patient is mutated, it's worth trying TAS for this patient. Um, but, you know, a young patient or younger patients that have alternative options and in which you want to achieve a quicker response, a more profound response because of symptoms, I'm not sure I will look necessarily at the mutation. I mean, 50% of CR is a low bar in follicular lymphoma. So, you know, we were talking before about what's actually happening in clinical practice. And here in these 50 oncologists, the median uh, number of pe uh, people who had used a, a bispecific was zero. So more than half of them haven't used it once. And actually the median for tazemetostat was only one, although some of these uh, docs had used it up to 10 times. Any myths or misperceptions out there about follicular lymphoma you think that you've seen as you see people getting referred into you? Well, I, I don't think there is misconception. I think, you know, when we manage this patient adequately with, you know, sequencing therapy over time, we should remember that the life expectancy of this patient is not a couple of years, it's 20 years. So median, which means I see patients that have been starting treatment 35 years ago. And, you know, you have probably to consider that the efficient agent here, and you should probably learn how your patient can benefit from this efficient agent because to me, what is important is to bring the patient in a status where the patient doesn't have to take a treatment for one year, two years, three years, four years, five years, have a treatment free interval, and whether a patient is 40, 60, or even 75, being off therapy is something that every patient's like. Well, tazemetostat is obviously a well-tolerated drug, as I said, better tolerated than where PI3 kinase, even probably with less side effects that BTK inhibitor, which are not major drugs in follicular. Now we have Zanu, Brutinib, and Obinotuzumab. But, you know, it, it's a drug that will work median of one year. So you have to consider what other patients you want to see in one year and start another treatment versus the patient you want to offer something that will have a, a longer duration of effect. And I think that's probably one of the questions regarding the use of this drug. A useful drug, yeah, good patients for these drugs, but you have to select them.
Would you like to look into your crystal ball and make some predictions about how we're going to be treating follicular lymphoma in three to five years? I think um, bispecific will come into first line of therapy, will replace chemo. After that, we'll have the choice of combining different agents, DAS plus R square or ZANU plus uh, R square or ZANU plus OBIN. Um, maybe, you know, renewing bispecific with other things or using chemo because chemo still works very well. And I think CAR-T will stay in third line or third line plus. I, I don't think they will come in earlier lines of treatment. Anything you want to add to what we've talked about today? Anything we didn't get into that maybe you want to bring up you think would be interesting? You know, as I said, follicular lymphoma, we, 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 we have to think long-term. You have to think about long-term toxicities. And with all these tools, we have to learn how to use them and try to offer them to patients at the right time and discuss with each patient what they want to achieve with the next treatment. Yeah, I think that's a great point. More and more we talk about that. There's so many difficult decisions in oncology nowadays, so many different options, and the whole idea of bringing the patient in is just so useful, I think, in that situation. I'm not sure how often that actually happens, though. We, we need time for that to discuss with patients. This concludes our program. Special thanks to Dr. Saul, and thank you for listening. This is Dr. Neil Love for What Clinicians Want to Know.